The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. It's called Jonestown, The Woman Behind the Massacre. Now, this is uh, primarily about the four women in Jim Jones' inner circle. Now, one was a wife, and I think the other three were mistresses. Uh, we'll find out more about that. And it will air on Monday, which is uh, February 26th, I believe, 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. So check your listings for A&E to find out your time and, and place. So uh, joining us to talk about this is a survivor of the Jonestown um, massacre, and uh, her name is Leslie Wagner Willis Wilson. Oh. And thank you for being on the show, Leslie. Thank you for having me. So, uh, Leslie, now, th now just let's kind of run through. Now, this, this happened in 1978. And uh, so that's that's a, quite a while ago, and some of the younger listeners probably won't know anything about this. Uh, I was around; I remember it, and and how shocking the whole thing was. Just the whole over 900 people um, ended up dead in this mass suicide. So, uh, Leslie, how how did it start for you? Like, how first of all, um, without going into too much detail, but how did you get to be there? Well, um, so again, thank you for having me. So I have to make one correction. It was a mass suicide. Um, it was a suicide massacre um, mm -hmm. because only because seven autopsies were done, and those show that there were injection marks um, in the shoulder blades. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. But I was brought into People's Temple. Um, which was based out of California when I arrived at the age of 13 because my sister was on um, heavy-duty drugs such as methylene and acid and LSD, and this was, of course, during the Love and Peace movement and um, during the late 60s. And so my mother wasn't with and She was um, a business owner, and we, a friend of hers told her about People's Temple who had a youth drug rehab program, and that's how we became involved. Now let's this jump into the special. So this seems to primarily focus on the woman in his life, in his inner circle, as we as they call it. Um, so, who were these 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 people we're talking about? They, one was his wife, um, Marceline, and the other ones right. were mistresses. Uh, how well did you know them? I didn't know them well because they were they were in the hierarchy. They were young. Um, Caucasian women, um, Annie Moore, which was his nurse. I'm not sure if she was his lover, but uh, she was his nurse. And then, of course, she ended up being a murderer. And then we had Carolyn Layton, her sister. And then we had a young woman um, by the name of Maria Casares. So these women were in their, um, I would say, early 20s, mid-20s. And um, Jim just, um, he was a grand manipulator. And um, they ended up being, again, um, lovers and um, co-conspirators, basically. So what do you think, uh, initially, they weren't really, um, there wasn't a big plan to have everybody commit suicide or to, to, to kill everybody initially when the group first went to Jonestown, um, if, I'm, if I'm correct on that. Well, you're correct, because no one went to Jonestown to die. I lost my entire family. Uh, people went to, to, to Jonestown to build a community. Um, that was uh, interracially, you know, um, harm with harmony, and our children were allowed to play freely without the concerns of gunfire or racism or um, discrimination, basically. That's why people left the space. They wanted to prove to the world or be an example that there can be a community that is self-sufficient um, and um, can live in harmony. Unfortunately, that's not, of course, how it ended, but no one went to Jonestown to die, not not one person. So so as a 13-year-old, you must have really, really loved it when you first got there. Well, I loved it because I was in the States, and what, what, I, what impressed me was the fact that I came from very um, adaptable household. My mother always took in people. 
she had a care home which had strangers that became part of the family that were mentally ill. And so I came from a family that was giving. I came from a family that was inclusive. And so when I first walked into People's Temple at the age of 13, I was excited. I was excited to know, because I came from an upper middle class family, I didn't know that people went to bed hungry. I didn't know that people suffered because it wasn't, that's not my experience. And so once learning this, learning this consciousness and this, you know, consciousness of the world and its suffering, I felt proud to be able to be a part of this. Um, at 13, I felt yeah. proud. <laughs> Well, what's what's the biggest thing you can say that um, how this experience has changed you? Oh my goodness! It has. Um, it was tough, of course, because I suffered from. You know, again, I lost my entire family. I escaped the morning of the massacre with the intent of coming back with my father to get my brother and my sister if they wanted to leave. And of course, that's not what happened. So, um, on the on the on the good. The good side, the positive aspects of what I learned was a sense of compassion for people that, that are in need, right, that are suffering. Um, I learned that we're all connected, right, and that really love is what binds us and keeps us um, level and peaceful. Um, but on the other hand, I suffered greatly, as most survivors did. We, you know, PTSD, um, so, um, survivor's guilt, you know, um, I got into drugs, I was escape. So life was really tough the first, I would say, almost 20 years. I was functional, but I was hurting inside because the pain was just too great. Um, but I learned now, you know, after the healing, I actually just got back from Jonestown two weeks ago and went back to Guyana after almost 40 years. And, and with that experience came a new peace. Um, I was able to say goodbye to my family. And I have learned that we have to go within so we don't go without. Um, that it's fine to be a believer in, in anything that's good, but we just have to be careful. We have to watch our steps, and we have to make sure that um, we're not in an a isolated situation where someone's trying to control us and manipulate us. And that's basically what happened with these three young women. Marshall, of course, they were manipulated, and then they were so they they became victims, and then they be, then they became the victimizers. So they began to victimize people. Um, it was kind of, you know, it was a circle. But I've learned to be grateful, and I've learned um, to keep continue to be able to love, right, and to try to give back as much as I can. So uh, how many survivors uh, came out of the uh, Jonestown? That's a very good question. There were a total of 30. Um, our, group, um, our group contained 11 survivors that walk through the jungle 30-something miles to the next town. Um, and then the other, the other portion of those survivors left with Congressman Ryan, and one, was, um, one, survive, one of the survivors was killed on the airstrip, Patricia Parks. So the total was, it was around 31 people that actually walked out of Jonestown that day and survived. So, you, you know, you're part of the group that walked out, walked to another town. Um, so... Did you know what was going to happen? And I don't, I don't mean that like, you know, oh, there, but did you, there must have been a reason you guys decided to leave. Well, there was. And I was, at that point, 20, I was working in the medical field with, with the doctor, Larry Shack. I was supposed to be sent to Cuba to become a doctor. And I began to witness things that, to me, weren't correct. There were those that were dedicated and considered some of the hierarchy that, that received health care. They even received trips to the capital to get to receive medical care. There were those that were um, potential flight risk who, who did not get care. And I mean people that, you know, had lupus. Um, and so I saw that I saw that discrepancy and I thought, wait a minute, this isn't socialism. And then it became, you know, it was, Jim became more and more erratic, more and more paranoid. Um, the community was a community that was being worked ten, you know, ten hour days, six days a week, no food, no nutritional food, rice and gravy was the staple, um, exhausted, um, mentally and spiritually, just exhausted. And so it wasn't the happy place that I first got to. Um, Jim was paranoid, you know, there was a custody battle going on, which helped participate in this whole, you know, entire event. Um, and so, I just wanted to leave. I wanted to get my child out because there was no talk of the future. And so on one hand, 
we did have a couple of suicide trips, right? Yeah. Revolutionary suicides, what Jim called them. But I, I never thought that we would die by our, our own hand. And remember that we were isolated. So everything that was given to us was given, it was, it was given to us from them. So we don't, we really never had a clue what was actually happening on the outside. So Jim said we were under attack. We believed we were under attack. Um, but I just saw this, this community change and I didn't want to be there any longer. I didn't want my son to go up there because again, there was no talk of the future. Uh, you know, I, I have to wonder. So, the, so there was a point where you started to feel it was different. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and w- yeah. W- what do you think? So, you know, Jim Jones, you say, started to become, like, paranoid and had different, um, he started to change. D- do you attribute anything in particular to that, or is it just something that evolved? Well, now that, you know, coming back home and years of research and, and, and exposure, things that are finally coming out, information that's finally being released and people talking, Jim was on drugs in the United States. The majority of the con- con- congregation did not know this. There, so there was, uh, he was already sadistic in, in the United States, right? Yeah. But in Jonestown, he was completely isolated. And because he ran after the article from the New West, uh, magazine was going to come out, which ex-members went and exposed some of the and some of the abuse that was going on. Um, he became a prisoner in Jonestown. So Jim, Jim never—I don't believe he ever intended on making Jonestown his permanent home. So here's a man that's in San Francisco at the height of so much change, right? Social, political change in San Francisco. He's part of the Housing Commission. He's, you know, being wine and dined by politicians. Everybody adores him. He's being, you know, his ego is being fulfilled. And then all of a sudden he ends up in the jungle. And it's just us. There's no lights. There's no camera. There's no, there's no spotlight on him. And his drug use, as I was to find out later, years later, was to the point to where when he was slurring his words, he wasn't sick. He was under the influence. But again... The, the membership didn't know this. The community didn't know this. Only those that were close to him knew, knew that he was abusing drugs. And yeah. So we're just putting ducks there. Yeah. Well, and, and, and well, I guess you weren't thinking that was going to happen. Um, now, you said you walked to another town with, with others. Uh, so did you guys not, you weren't able to just ask to leave or... You had to. You had to actually. Oh, no. You had to. I, I mean, I'm just trying to catch the feeling of it. Like so. No. Right. Yeah. So we were prisoners, basically. The, the camp was in the middle of the jungle. The closest Georgetown, the capital, was an hour by air, right? That you had to have a plane, and 24 hours by boat. We were up against the Venezuela border. Um, there was a territorial dispute, and that's why they chose that land, because they would, Venezuela would never come in on United States citizens. And so, but we were totally isolated. So when we got there, they took our passports. So we, and, and once you went into Jonestown, you really didn't go out. So you didn't know what was out there. Jim told us that if anyone tried to leave or escape, that the Guyanese government, you know, was on watch for us, they would arrest us. They would, um, we would be under arrest and, and all these lies that we thought were true because how, why would we not think they were true? We didn't know anything else or what we were, what we were being told. So no, there was no way to, um, us leaving and when we walked to this next town, we had no idea what we were going to face. We didn't know if they were friend or foe. Um, because again, we hadn't been out. We weren't exposed to the outside. We were actually prisoners inside of you know, Jonestown. No one could just ask to leave and be able to leave. That was out of the question. Wow. And so, um, um, did you know that there was going to be? Uh, well, I guess you wouldn't. But um, when when they were kind of, um, you know, there was that congressman there and uh, all mm-hmm. of that activity just before the the end. Um, did you see any of that, or did you did you think that was going well? Well, you know, we had planned, we had 
the, our leader of the group, his name was Richard Clark, and my friend who allowed me, voted me to go, her name was Diane Louie. So the night when the, when the congressman came on the 17th of November, 1978, I was optimistic to a certain degree. Um, it looked as if it was going well. We did the whole entertainment that we do for guests. You know, we had, we actually had a good dinner, which we rarely had. Um, and so it looked like it was going well until we heard that someone passed a note to one of the reporters saying they wanted to leave. Not only did we know that someone passed a note, but we knew who it was. And that created some tension already in the air because we were like, oh, my gosh, it's starting, right? Um, and we were going to leave that night, but because of that note, uh, Richard said we're going to, you know, we're going to leave the next day. So it looked like it was going well from all, but we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. We only saw what was presented to us in the front, right? Yeah. Um, and even on Saturday when we decided to, to leave, uh, the tension in the community was just, you could just cut it with a knife. It was almost, it was so quiet, you know. Um, it was just really quiet. And there was something in the air. I just, I, I couldn't put, I couldn't put my finger on it. And later on, I would know that it was, you know, she had other plans. Yeah. Yeah, and he must have had this sort of planned for a little bit of time, right? It wasn't just a spur-of-the-moment idea. You're right, because there was sign I found on the, there was sign I found that um, came in months later. A month, I'm sorry, months earlier. They were already testing on a pig, I think, to see what the dosage would be. So this this was actually something that was, you know, it sounds was going to be put in place to what degree we don't, you know, we still don't know as if this just actually just, you know, quickened the plan or, or was it planned for this time? You know, if anyone came in like this because we're not, we're just not sure. Um, but I think that, you know, I just, again, I, I didn't see it coming from us, even though we had the test and I, and I wonder there's time because I lost my entire family. I wonder at times, did people think it was a test first because we had them before and they were fake? You know, they weren't real, so maybe they thought that. Right. Um, and also the fact that they were exhausted, you know. But I I know that people, I don't believe that, well, children don't commit suicide. You know, there's over 300 children that died. But I, I just think that... Um, <laughs> There's a lot more to the story. I hope I, I find we find out before I leave this world. But um, it was a horrific, you know, terrible incident. It was the largest loss of life um, before 9/11 of civilians. Um, the majority of the people were black women. That was the those were the women um, that propelled um, the finances, right? right. Um, and we do have a new website called BlackJonestown.org. It talks about and we're dissecting this, this, how do, how do black women, my mother was intelligent business owner, we, we didn't grow up poor, um, how did she, you know, what caused her to join and what caused her to stay, you see? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's just, it's a tragedy. We're going on, you know, this November will be 40 years. And you're right, you know, but what I do, what I do, what I have seen is I get many requests from students that are doing Jonestown History pro- Project. So yeah. these things, this, this conversation, this dialogue is important, A&E. You know, this is important because kids that weren't even born are, are interested, right? Yeah. And shows like yours. So I, I thank you for that. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. We, we do a lot of these, um, these, these, these things that happened in the 60s and 70s and, uh, we have so many people that are young that are 20 and under. They have no idea. Um, right. It's just crazy. Uh, what do you What do you think the biggest thing is is coming out of this uh, two hour special? What What's the most important thing people can get from it? For me, um, you know, I wanted to dispel the myth that there was a a lot of crazy black folks that just ran to the jail and killed themselves, right? That was that was a stigma that I came back to. I'm, I'm asking that. Um, so I wanted to sell the myth that, and I also want I want it's I want 
the viewers would love to see that even though Jim Jones preached in equality, correct? That was not the case in Peace Temple. The majority of the leadership was Caucasian. Um, and I'm, and we, we look at these three, we look at these four women. Marcelin was abused, of course. Um, but I want them to see another side of this. So they could say, okay, well, look, look who was behind the scenes that we didn't know about, right? That's never been highlighted. Highlight. Here are these young women, and it's a call to women too to say you have to be careful. They were they were young and they were they were very easily manipulated, and they again became the victims. So it's a different dialogue. Um, I've been I've done plenty of uh, documentaries. I've always mentioned this conversation. Let's talk about the four women, the three women, and so A and E has has had the um, the wherewithal to pick it up and do it. So I think it's going to be a great. Um, I think it'll really be a good show, and it'll give the viewers something else, another um, dialogue, another conversation. Well, when we talk about these four four women, and now how what's what's your feeling on them? Like, do you, do you look at them as uh, evil and bad, and, and or do you look at them as uh, um, complete victims, like they they were brainwashed? Like, where where do you put them in this field? Well, I, it's both, actually. Um, I believe that they were young, and Jim was very charismatic, right? Right. Um, what, where else do you find women can fly all over the world and deposit millions of dollars in the bank and have access? Oh, yeah. what, what organization do you know? You see, so there's, and there's this path. So he fed to their ego. He fed to their need for, I don't know if it's a father, father figure, attention, not sure because I, I didn't have that close relationship with them. But they were they became victims because he manipulated them. And then, as with Jim, power, right, can breathe a lot. Some good, some bad. So I don't look at them as evil. I look at them as active participants and planners of this because they were so loyal to him that they went ahead and proceeded even... even though he was not in the mental or physical condition to carry this through himself. This did not have to go as far as it did. They could have stopped this, but they, because of their loyalty to him, they went ahead and proceeded with it. Jim did not mix the boys, and Jim was from, you know, even the night before, you can see some of the videotapes of that day. He was slurring his words. He looked like he was under the influence of something. He was in no condition to make a decision, but because they were, yeah, brainwashed, right? Yeah. Because we cannot forget this was a cult. Some people don't like the word. It was a cult. People were controlled. That they 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 took the entire distance of, of carrying out his wishes. I, so I don't hate them. No. Listen, I had to for, I had to forgive Jim Jones, right? That was a, that was the beginning of my healing. Was to forgive Jim Jones. I've forgiven, I've forgiven them in the same way that I've forgiven Jim Jones and the other active participants who we, who we do not know. Larry Schaaf was one of them, the doctor. So I've had to forgive them because I have to let go in order to be able to heal, right, to get through that. Right. Yeah, you have to move on. And I, I, just, um, I just wonder, but, you know, this whole Jonestown scenario and the four woman and other people that might have been involved that we don't know about mm -hmm. do you think that us as a human nature has changed because of this have we learned from this is my point like could this happen now mm -hmm. and, and I sort of think it could. Mm -hmm. I don't know about I you I think you're people. right yeah no I, I think you're right because look at the climate that we're in yeah you see, uh, Jim Jones came came at a time where again there were social political changes. We were in a whole different we were in a whole different world, right? A whole different. Oh my gosh! And I was only thirteen. I was marching in peace marches before I went to People's Temple, and so um, we're in this. We're so divided, and we're disconnected. So. Could it happen again? Unfortunately, I, I believe so. I we have we have churches um, that are running off the the same type of control. Mainstream churches. I, I get calls and letters, emails about um, mainstream churches that are cult like. And so, 
we have to be careful. Um, but can it happen again? Unfortunately, I I can't say I can't say no that it couldn't. I just think people are when people feel threatened and they feel lost and they don't and they're and they're confused and um, things are, normal things are slipping away from them as they as and they're not. I, I just think it's a it's, it's a possibility. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, fair. yeah, yeah. I see it. I see it a lot. I see a lot of people that get, uh, you know, uh, like you said. There's a lot of division. Uh, people select mm-hmm. their en- enemies as people they don't understand or know. You're so, right. And it's uh, but it's so important if you see, if people see something to say something. You know, if you have a friend that you see the changes and they're here in a group. I don't care if. It's, I've been in network marketing, and I found myself thinking, goodness gracious, I'm kind of I'm going off the deep end here a little bit, right, with yeah. my enthusiasm. <laughs> um, so you have to be careful, um, and that's peer pressure, too. Um, there were things that I saw early on as a kid, you know, 15, 16, I wondered about, but when I looked at everyone else, the adults, and they're, they're clapping, they're singing, they're happy, they're, and they, they don't say a word about what I just heard that bothered me. So then I think, yeah. Well, guess what? It must be me. It's gotta be just me. So. Yeah. Yeah. There's something yeah. about a group or mob mentality, I guess, that, mm. you know, everyone mm. gets involved. It's, uh, how, and so how, how were the people to you when you came back to the States? How did you find the reception? Were people mean or were they uh, just wanted to stay away from you? Uh, kind of what was, what was the reaction to, to the, to where you went? I I didn't give them opportunity because I changed my name and I went underground. I, I might have been on one I don't I wasn't even on the television show. I I just went underground. But I know from what I read in the newspapers, I felt you know, I felt my goodness, look how they're looking at us. Right? So I couldn't I that was a secret for me for almost twenty years. Um when I wrote the book, I had to email my friends because I didn't know who I told them and who I didn't. It was that, you know, I died, my family died in a car accident. Um, my, one of my bosses said, gosh, I thought you were grew up as an orphan or in foster care because you never spoke about your family. So um, the stigma was there, though. People said, why are all these people following this, you know, white man in the jungle? And my dad was, you know, Caucasian. So I didn't look at, I didn't grow up with color. So for me, it was, he, he was, he wasn't any different than my dad, right? Um, but there was a stigma and it's still, I would say probably the last, I would say 20 years, it's changing. The conversation's changing. People are more, people have more empathy. Empathy. And I think they, they could see that, gosh, that, that could have, maybe that could have been me. You know, maybe I would have, join this, you know. Um, but they weren't very kind. You know, they, they, they weren't just from, just well, from the articles that I read. They, they yeah, weren't very yeah. kind. There's a, there's a general concept that, oh, you know, same as people that get in, in, involved in crime and different things and they say, well, I, I wouldn't have never done that or they never, you know, so there's a it's kind of a judgment call people make. Right. You know, and it's kind of silly in a way because... I guess it's a defense mechanism. They don't realize that we're just humans and we're all subject to things that happen. So, you know, crazy, Worry. crazy. Well, it sounds and like it's, know. I'm just going to say, it sounds like mm-hmm. it's better now for you, like it, it, to be out, but I couldn't imagine. Oh, right. You had to keep it a secret, so you had to create a whole kind of false life to present to people. Yes, yes, that yes. Must, that must but be. on the inside, I was, it was horrible because I was hurting. Um, and then no one said, I didn't get any counseling, right? So I'm, I'm left to my own devices to try to work through this tragedy, not understanding it. So it took me a long time um, to um, understand what I had to do was I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't go to churches. It was, I tried. It was very difficult. So I just had to develop this personal relationship. Right, because I am a believer. Right. Um, with God, and I just I had to do it on my own, and um, and get through it. And so the healing, my healing really didn't start until 2007. It wasn't that long ago. 
Um, I was functional, barely, right? I was functional, <laughs> but um, I hit it well. And I think, you know, I think I tell people I should have won an Oscar in Jonestown because I was constantly thinking about leaving. I, you know, you had to put on this facade that everything was okay. Um, so um, it was difficult, and that's why I tell people, you know, when you're a tragedy, you have to talk about it. You have to talk. Even if it's talking out loud, you have to speak of it, right? You have to speak on it because um, it will just it will tear you apart inside because you're not you're not healing, yeah. you know. And you miss out so much when you when you don't follow that process. But um, you have to have a great support system too. And my grandparents just weren't they just weren't cut out for that. Well, and I was going to say that would be a, a, a terrible burden to live with and not be able to talk about it to get through it. So you kind of put yourself right. on hold for 20 years while you're mm-hmm. living a different life, and mm-hmm. it, 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 you can't let go when it's still in your mind. You know, I just, mm-hmm. and especially when you're young, you know, 13, 20, it's right. like so young to, to deal with that. Right. right? Amazing. Right. I tell you, it's, it's what yeah. you've been through. Well, I guess it's made you a very strong and uh, good soul now. You know, it's it's kind of, <laughs> it comes out in a, in a in a way, but uh, you know, at at this point in your life. But wow, um, I couldn't imagine. You know, I think it's uh, amazing what you've been through, and uh, and uh, I just uh, I I don't know what I what I would have done, but. Uh, Wow. So um, now you have have a book as well, which you were mentioning. Let's uh, let's give out your website and where people can look you okay. up or maybe communicate and and pick up your book, as well as the show Perfect. coming out. Um, wh- where do they Thank get you? So they can go to www.lesliewagnerwilson.com. That's my web page. Um, you can order the book, Slavery, it's Slavery, S-L-A-V-E-R-Y, of Faith, um, on Amazon. It is probably the most, um, you know, pretty much anywhere else, but Amazon is where it's kind of housed. And um, you can email me if you want to have a conversation. I do speak to people that reach out about whatever they want to talk about. Um, you know, I've been through homelessness and drug addiction and you name it, I think. So I've kind of, I have a lot of experience in a lot of different areas, and I'm just, um, I'm here to serve. That's, that's what I've discovered. I'm here to serve. So thank you for that. Yeah. Well, that's great. I, I'm, I'm glad it's, uh, I don't want to say turned out great, but I'm glad it's at least um, you seem to be resolved of a lot of the yeah. early stuff. So that's, yeah. that's amazing. Um uh, so the show, it's on A&E on Monday, and that's the 26th, and it's at 9 p.m. Pacific or Eastern. And, of course, check your local listings of, of how you get A&E. And it's called Jonestown, The Woman Behind the Massacre. And our guest has been Liz, Leslie Wagner Wilson. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you so much for having me. Find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.